Joining us today for the first time is John Lear. John Lear, as you all know, has been involved in ufology for over 25 years. He actually was the person that Bob Lazar first came to the story. There's going to be an incredible new movie about him called The Immaculate Deception, which is produced and directed uh, by Jeremy Kenyon Lockyer Corbell, who is on air. Jeremy, how are you today? I'm good, Dr. J. How are you doing? Excellent. And speaking of the Immaculate Deception, let's also plug in John's website, which is realjohnlear.com, as well as jilllear.com. That's his daughter's site with some amazing artwork. And speaking of all that, why don't we bring in the man himself, Mr. Lear. How are you? Dr. J, doing fine. What's going on? Ah, it's a pleasure to have you on. And, you know, now we are actually also joined by the founder of Third Phase of Moon, Blake Cousins, and who uh, I'm going to give the honors of the first question. Blake, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Dr. J, for uh, having us right here at Third Phase of Moon. This is going to be uh, another historic show that we're going to be putting on Third Phase of Moon Radio. And I wanted to uh, thank John Lear for joining us right here at Third Phase. Former CIA uh, pilot, he's broken 18 world speed records, and his dad was the inventor of the Lear jet. Wow. Uh, John Lear, let me ask you first, what got you into ufology, and uh, how did you come across Bob Lazar? Well, I was kind of interested in uh, ufology, but didn't pay much attention to it until 1985 when I was at a reunion of Southeast Asia pilots here in Las Vegas. And uh, one of the guys um, who was who I knew over there in uh, Southeast Asia was Greg Wilson, and I asked him where all he'd been, and he mentioned he'd been flying out of Bentwaters, which is a U.S. Air Force base in England, and uh, been flying A-10s. And I said, oh, Bentwaters, that's supposedly where the uh, saucer landed in uh, the Christmas of uh, 1980. He said, no, not supposedly. It did. He said, I didn't get to see it because I was confined to quarters, but I know the guys who did. And so I said, you mean this stuff is real? There really are saucers? He said, yeah. So that's what be, started me on the uh, the search, and I did a lot of driving around the western states because in those days, you know, we didn't have the Internet, <clears throat> and uh, ran into all kinds. It seems like everything fell into place. Everything I went to, I got uh, more information, more information, and, and then in uh, <clears throat> 1987, uh, a guy called, and he wanted a copy of all my stuff, and uh, <clears throat> I said, well, you know, I'm kind of, my wife is kind of uh, irritated all the calls I'm getting, so I've kind of discontinued everything. He said, well, if you ever get around to it, you know, I'd like a copy. If you do, uh, I'm an appraiser, and uh, I'll uh, appraise your house for, for free or for trade. And so I said, great. So he came over, and uh, the guy that was holding a, the, the measuring tape was his friend, Bob Lazar. And so... Gene Huff and I, the guy that the appraiser, are uh, talking about uh, saucers, and um, uh, Bob Lazar is rolling his eyes. He said, look, guys, he said, I worked at Los Alamos um, National Laboratories, and if it had been anything to this, I would have known. And uh, so that was the summer of um, 87, and uh, no, it was in 88. And uh, during the next three months, four months, we gave him enough information that intrigued him and he had uh, he had left the uh, the scientific uh, world, but he decided to re-enter, and he called his friend Dr. Teller, who was the uh, father of the H bomb, uh, who he knew from Los Alamos, and said, "I'd like to uh, get back to work in the scientific uh, world." And so Teller said, "Do you want to work with me here at Lawrence Livermore, Bob, or do you want to work there in Nevada?" And Bob said, "I want to work at Area 51." So. Um, after that, Bob got three technical interviews, and I guess he aced them all because the next thing I knew was on December 6th of 1988, he came to my house and he said, sat down, and he always did, you know, in the evening, and and uh, I said, what's going on? He said, I saw a disc today. I said, what? And he said, I saw a disc. And I said, theirs or ours? He said, theirs. I said, oh, my God, you went to Groom Lake? He said, yep. And uh, I said, well, why don't you, uh, uh, why come over here? You know they followed you. Uh, I said, why don't you find out what's going on and then tell me uh, what, what you found out. And he said, no. He said, you've taken so much jazz over all of this flying saucer stuff that I want to tell you it's true. I touched it. I was in it. And it's real. And it is extraterrestrial. So that started the whole thing with Bob Lazar. 
You know, I, I got a question for you. When Bob Lazar went to work at EG&G, which uh, obviously took him from McCarran Airport to Janet Airlines to Area 51, and then the bus drove him to S4, wasn't when during when he was interviewed for his job, wasn't he asked about his association with you? Yeah. And he, that was the second interview, and they said uh, the first question was, uh, do you know John Lear, and what is your opinion of him? And he said, I know John Lear, uh, but I think he sticks his nose in places where it doesn't belong. And when Bob told me that, he said, what I didn't tell them was that I also like to stick my nose into places it doesn't belong. Good answer. <laughs> like that, yeah, you know, we just released a video about 48 minutes ago on uh, Third Phase of Moon uh, Breaking News, and I wanted to ask you, Mr. Lear, if Bob Lazar spoke of other kinds of objects or uh, reverse-engineered flying craft alien technology, because what we just broke is uh, two jetliners escorting a massive UFO over Yingying, China. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of this. It was breaking news. It's been out for 24 years, uh, excuse me, 24 hours, and it's on uh, Google, Google Maps, and it's an incredible image of two major jetliners escorting a plasmic kind of energy kind of orb. Is there anything that Bob Lazar said besides the saucers? Was there any other kind of technology that they're using? No, he just, um, he talked about the, uh, uh, he was given briefings, and briefings in a way of, um, uh, they were pamphlets. Uh, anywhere from uh, five or ten pages to fifty pages, and I guess there was about uh, forty or fifty of them. And he was put in a room, and he was told to read those um, briefings. And this was more or less to bring him up to speed about what they had uh, uncovered uh, up till then. And these briefings were stapled about halfway through, and uh, as his clearance was raised. Uh, the staples would be moved further back uh, as he became eligible for more information. Now, isn't it true that they compartmentalize everything? And that's why I was wondering why an engineer like Bob Lazar would be given access to everything from the autopsy photographs to the fact that the ETs possibly created us to the fact that they had 63 or 65 external corrections and so on and so forth. Yeah, well, uh, the uh, compartmentalization is true, and they do com compartmentalize everything, which is why we don't make very much progress. But he was get, he was uh, his clearance was going to be majestic, and that's the top. So he would be uh, aware of quite a lot, not everything, but uh, more than uh, anybody else below him. Bob Lazar has kind of been out of the limelight over the past uh, decade or so. I, I, I don't really see anything new on him. There's basically old film, uh, you know, 60-millimeter film of him. There's nothing to present day. Where's Bob Lazar now, and why didn't he uh, come out and speak more publicly about his uh, work at Area 51? Because he said all he had to say, it was true. He works in Langsburg, Michigan. He has a company called UnitedNuclear.com. He distributes, sells uh, scientific equipment to universities and schools and scientific uh, uh, companies all over the world. And uh, he just stays pretty much to himself. Uh, he's told me that, uh, you know, when all said and done, he wish he hadn't come out because he would like to... Uh, to be at the top of the uh, uh, of the uh, information uh, uh, information world and uh, know a lot more. But one of the reasons that he didn't go back after he and I and, and a couple others were caught watching the saucers was the fact that uh, when he got on the airplane on the uh, red and white 737 at McCarran to go to Groom Lake, uh, he could remember getting on the airplane, and he could remember getting off when he came back to McCarran, but he couldn't remember anything else. So uh, they have a mind control system that uh, is, is fantastic, that you can't remember anything that you worked on. But more than that, it doesn't bother you. You don't go home and say, geez, I wonder what I did today, uh, which was a problem before in the years before. But now they develop mind control to the point where uh, uh, they, they, you don't even remember uh, what you did and it doesn't bother you.
What's the most shocking revelation that you got from from Bob Lazar from everything that he told you? I know he told you about uh, what the crafts are powered and and the fact that he saw an ET through a window. But what do you think was the most startling thing that you heard? You know, I haven't thought about that, but uh, the most, I guess. I knew pretty much everything the the uh, or heard about everything. The most shocking thing it, it was true that you know everything was true. Uh, but one night in January of 1989, he came into my den and uh, usually what he did at night and uh, and uh, he's talking and uh, he gave me the high sign which means let's go out in the back. I have a, a stable and some some acreage out in the back and uh, we didn't talk about. Uh, secret things in my room because we knew it was bugged. So uh, we went out in the um, in the back. We walked by the pool, and my wife was out there doing something. She's always suspicious of us, and she says, "Where are you guys going?" And uh, we said, "Oh, we're just going to go uh, out in the back see something." So we went out in the in the back alleyway there, and uh, he he was just really excited. I said, "What? What? What?" He said, "John, you will never know what it's like to see your first alien." I said, "You saw him." And he said, yep. And I said, couldn't have been a doll, couldn't have been a monkey, couldn't have been a fake anything. Nope. He said, I saw it. I was being escorted by two uh, military police uh, along this corridor. And through this door, there was a a 12 by 12 uh, inch window. And uh, I looked through that. And there was two scientists in lab coats facing me and a gray about uh, three and a half, four feet tall facing them. He said, no possibility it was a fake. Now, since then, of course, he said that I'm making it up. But uh, I saw him once in Albuquerque about three or four years, no, more than that, five five or six years ago. And uh, we're just talking away. And I said, are you sure you don't remember? And he said, yeah, I remember. So that confession to me was, was kind of neat. So he's uh, going back and forth on his uh, statement? Pardon? So is he going back and forth on his statement? Yeah. He said he, uh, he doesn't want to mention he doesn't want to mention that uh, he saw a real alien because he's taken so much flack over just seeing a flying saucer. People aren't ready for that. And uh, to actually say that he saw a real live alien uh, is, is you know much more uh, shocking to the public. So uh, he didn't want to say that, and he doesn't like me talking about it. But so much. For that. We did a show with uh, Ron Gardner. He explained to us uh, also about Dan Bursch, who uh, per- said that he worked in Area 51 as well, and he uh, knew all about the J Rod. Uh, is this the same alien that? Uh, Lazar saw? Is this J-Rod? No, the the J-Rod is something the government faked to make uh, a simile, something that they could uh, control and uh, say that this was actually the uh, um, somebody from uh, the future who somehow came back in time and uh, needed our scientists to help fix him for whatever was wrong with his his civilization and then uh, uh, he left somehow. They went over to Egypt and uh, <clears throat> went to the pyramids, and somehow he disappeared in a flash of light. No, I'm not buying the J. Rod story. Did you hear about any other extraterrestrials or a different species from Bob Lazar other than the Greys? Did I hear? No, I don't think so. I think uh, the Greys are the only ones that uh, he talked about. What other races do you know about that have visited Earth? Well, there's uh, the government 20 years ago knew about 57 different races that were visiting Earth. There's eight races that uh, work up at Area 51. Uh, I'm, that's information that was 20 years old, so there's probably more now. Um, unbeknownst to the public, our universe wasn't the result of the Big Bang, and it wasn't born uh, 17 billion years ago. It was infinite. It's infinite. Uh, so is our lifetime. Uh, when we're born, we're given a soul. That's forever. It never goes away. We may uh, we may pass away from this this lifetime, but we'll go on to the next one, and it goes on forever and ever. So um, the universe is is infinite. Absolutely, I think uh, it's 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 basically it'll never end. There's nothing behind it. We have no idea how. Uh, how alone or not alone we are on this earth because it's so massive. 
this, this doesn't, it's yeah. beyond comprehension. But I wanted to ask you about, you've flown over 150 aircraft, and you're certified by the Federal Aviation. You're, you're, you had a certificate granted from the, from the Federal Aviation Administration. Was there any kind of protocol when you're flying for the CIA, if you're ever to come across a UFO, and where would you report it to? No. There's no protocol. I never saw anything while I was working for them. My work was in uh, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, Africa. Uh, in those days, you know, I was busy flying the airplane, and that was way before I became interested in UFOs, which, which was in 1985. The work I did with them was <clears throat> between 1967 and 1970 <clears throat> when I ferried airplanes to uh, Vietnam, Republic of Vietnam, the forward air control airplanes uh, that were built in uh, Wichita. And then uh, in 72, 73, I flew in uh, Laos uh, for a, a cutout company, Continental Air Services, Inc., which was the same, did the same kind of work as Air America. <clears throat> and then later in uh, 77, did some work in uh, um, Somalia, and then uh, in 1982-83, I did some work in Egypt. Uh, and But, you know, I wasn't interested in, in anything, never saw anything uh, in those days. Actually, I did see something in 1966 when I was flying a Learjet. I was descending into L.A., and I saw something pass me uh, during my descent, and it went from uh, the left side of the airplane uh, below me to above me and to the right side of the airplane, and it looked exactly like what they call the flying bathtub, which was the M2F2, which was, if you remember, the $6 million man, that was the uh, airplane that he supposedly crashed in. And that's what I thought I saw, but only later, when I became interested in the UFOs, did I realize how ridiculous it was to have seen uh, a... Uh, a a uh, highly technical airplane like that going through the approach corridor for Los Angeles. So that was definitely uh, an, a, a UFO. Several years ago, when Art Bell was still a host of Coast to Coast, you did the uh, ET briefing, and in there you mentioned, among other things, that the uh, small grays are glorified robots, if you will, and you also mentioned that the Cold War was manufactured for the secret, to keep the secrecy. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I think the Cold War was uh, manufactured because in 19, uh, end of the uh, World War II, it became uh, evident that uh, there was... Um, uh, extraterrestrials. Um, they had recovered several craft. Most people think is um, Roswell is the first recovery, but the first recovery was 1941 in the Cape Girado, Missouri, uh, and uh, there was probably some before that. But uh, they knew what was what was going on, and uh, in order to keep the public, they thought it was so serious, in order to keep the public focused on something else, they manufactured a war between us and Russia. And um, you'll notice that everything that uh, happened in space was divvied up. The, the Russians didn't go to the moon, they went to Venus. We uh, split up the uh, duties of going, and uh, of course they didn't go to the moon, we didn't go to the moon either. Uh, that was all a, um, a hoax, not a hoax, a scam. Um, there's no possible way that we could have gone to the moon. But they got away with it, and it's been a secret for, what, 40 years now. And um, uh, that's the way it went. So as far as, we uh, uh, just also grace, posted, what about the video from China when uh, China just la landed their uh, rover on the moon? Was Is that... You look at the you look at the ground on the surface. It's like dark dirt, like uh, you know regular dirt right here on Earth, and it, that looks real. And then the NASA videos, all, you know, they come out it almost looks like a Hollywood stage. Did China make it to to uh, the moon? Uh, I doubt it because what they what China is using is old NASA pictures. And uh, they don't have any new pictures of your own of their own, and also they aren't in any uh, format. They're just uh, they're kind of um, uh, split diagonal photos that looks like they were cut from something else. So, uh, uh, yeah, we uh, we couldn't have gone there. You know, we're coming to our first break in a couple minutes, but we still got a couple minutes. I wanted to ask you about Venus. Uh, I know you said that it's supposed to, apparently, the NASA tells us that the, the temperature is, is too hot uh, for any life, but 
you mentioned that the parachute didn't melt, so therefore it's it's lying. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. We're told that the uh, temperature of a planet is directly proportional to the distance from the sun. That's not true. The sun emits an electro electromagnetic wave, and the atmosphere of each planet is what modifies that wave to, to regulate the temperature on the surface of the planet. For instance, mercury is very close to the sun, and we're told it's hot enough to melt lead. It's not. It's the same temperature as Earth. Uh, we're told that Pluto is so far away that uh, you could uh, uh, you could have icebergs uh, there and, and nothing else, but that's not true. It has the same temperature of Earth because the temperature of the planet is modified by the atmosphere, uh, modifying the electromagnetic wave that comes from the sun. We're just putting out more videos uh, today, as a matter of fact, about uh, Mars and the curiosity of uh, anomalies captured within the photographs in this billion pixel NASA montage that they put out. And they're putting out, it looks like there's a bird flying on Mars. We don't know what's going on, but it's very suspicious. We just posted that uh, video up just a few minutes ago. But I also wanted to ask you if you were aware of uh, Bill, Bill Dana, you know, he's 83, he flew the X-15 rocket. He was, going faster than a speeding bullet. He died at 83 today, and he also worked for NASA. Did you ever uh, come across Bill Dana and talk about his beliefs in UFOs? No, I sure didn't. Um, I didn't have a chance to get with uh, any of the astronauts. I've heard what they've had to say, but of course this mind control thing is why the astronauts are so sure that they went to the moon. Um, and I don't know how the mind control works, but it, it works very, very well. They, they really believe they went there, but there's no possibility they did. Uh, first of all, the gravity on the moon is not one-sixth of Earth. It's 70% uh, of Earth, uh, and if it was 70%, there's no way we could add enough fuel to go to the moon, take off, and uh, come back. Um, the uh, civilization on the moon numbers a quarter of a billion people, just like us, but they're not from Earth. They're from someplace else. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back with John Lear and Jeremy Corbell in a couple short minutes. Back with filmmaker and director Jeremy Kenyon Lockyer Corbell, and of course, who's making the movie on John Lear, Immaculate Deception. Right before we went to break, a uh, caller or said, that, talking about the moon, several of the guests we've had in the past have said that they believe we went to the moon and when we got there that ET scared us off and when they saw uh, discs on there and bases on there. What do you know about that? That's a cover story that uh, NASA released. To, uh, th they want to make us for sure believe that we went to the moon because it was uh, you know, it, it's supposed to be a technological achievement. Uh, and, uh, and that we were able to do that, but we weren't. There's too much radiation uh, around the Earth. Uh, there's a gravity on the moon. It's 70% uh, that of Earth's. Uh, there's an atmosphere there, a breathable atmosphere. There's all kinds of things that, uh, that would uh, tell somebody that uh, we weren't able to make it. For the people who are really interested, I tell them to pick up a book written by Perry Spalter. That's S-P-O-L-T-E-R, Perry Spalter. And the, the book is called The Gravitational Force of the Sun. And it completely debunks Newton's uh, universal uh, gravitational force uh, and explains what it really is. And the gravitational force has nothing to do with the density or size uh, of matter. It has to do with the, um, uh, the distance from the sun and the area swept uh, going around the sun. And this is Kepler's third law. And if you read Perry Spalter's book, you'll understand that, <clears throat> that uh, Newton was wrong and uh, that the, uh, the uh, gravitational force on the uh, moon uh, could very well be uh, 70%. Uh, Perry worked for me uh, doing the mathematics uh, without using uh, Newton's uh, law, using the uh, Bully-Aldous uh, law of uh, inverse square. And she says that uh, based using the three uh, planets, or the three objects, the uh, Earth, the moon, and the sun, that the gravitational force when Apollo 11 landed on July 20th, 1969, was 68% that of uh, Earth. So uh, 
I want to make it clear that Barry Spalter doesn't believe uh, me that uh, that 68% uh, is good for the entire surface of the moon. Um, she doesn't believe that, but I do. And uh, the, I get my information from Howard Menger. Howard Menger went to the moon in 1956. He wrote a book about it and told about uh, being picked up uh, around uh, Los Angeles somewhere and being taken for two weeks uh, that he spent on the moon. He says that the um, uh, daytime color of the sky is a saffron yellow, and uh, I have that saffron yellow on the uh, some of the moon pictures I have on um, on uh, Pegasus uh, Research Consortium and also the livingmoon.com. Jose Escamilla has been working on uh, the moon and it's been there He's, he's hooked up with a guy, I forgot his name, but he has a Celestron telescope, and he, obviously you can see atmosphere, different colors of the moon, and it's not gray by any means. And we've also spoken with an astronaut, thanks to Dr. J, for hooking up the incredible historic interview we did with Mr. Edgar Mitchell, the third mission to, the third, uh, man, third mission to the moon, and he claims that he went to uh, the moon and back, but he also believes that there are bases on the far side of the moon. So what do you think about that? Well, there's not bases. There's cities all over the moon. I've got pictures uh, all over my wall of um, of uh, pictures on the near side. There's a uh, city plainly visible, 125 miles northwest of Copernicus. Uh, there's one in the Damaso craters. Uh, I mean, they're all over the place if you take the time to look. Now, you aren't going to find them looking with a Celestron uh, telescope, even if you have 21 inches, what you're going to do is have to look at the pictures that were taken um, by the Lunar Observer um, satellites that went up between 1965 and 1967. And they were published by NASA before they knew how many cities were up there. And they didn't do a real careful job of airbrushing all the cities. So we can see them by then. As far as seeing an atmosphere with a Celestron scope, you're not going to see it because the atmosphere is uh, is maybe... Uh, a mile or two above the surface, and you're just not going to going to see it that kind of a uh, atmosphere uh, with a celestron scope. Aside from the moon, where else do you think in our solar system is habited? Every single planet that's in our solar system, and there's 40 different planets. We're only told about nine. Uh, the uh, NASA knows of about a few more, but they're not ready to tell us about all the, the ones that there are. Every single one of the 40 and their moons has civilizations. Our solar system is chock full of civilizations. Some of the uh, people there look like us, some don't. Um, the uh, Sasquatch, the uh, Bigfoot, uh, comes from Mars. Uh, and whatever they're, I don't know what they're doing here, but uh, uh, that's where they come from. Venus has uh, uh, billions of people there. So does Saturn, so does Neptune, so does Uranus. All of them have uh, civilizations. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, we're kept in the dark and, uh, and not told about any of that. You mentioned earlier in the show that there's these NASA brainwashing techniques to compartmentalize these the astronauts' brains so they're trained not to reveal that their uh, mission to the moon was a fraud. How, do you know how they go about some of these techniques? What are the what are these uh, ways of doing to programming? How does this programming work? Well, it okay, came from uh, it came from um, the uh, Nazi Germany at the end of World War II. Uh, we let three thousand um, SS uh, SS and scientists in, and that was Project Paperclip, and that was managed by Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, John Foster Dulles, his brother, who was uh, Secretary of State, and Eleanor Dulles, who was head of the Berlin desk for the U.S., and they brought in 3,000 of those people, and uh, well, the first thing they did was take over NACA, NACA, which became NASA, uh, and they ran the entire program. Um, they probably still do, uh, but uh, they brought with them the techniques of mind control that they had uh, uh, worked on and uh, completely uh, uh, made them much, much better. Now, they came over in uh, 49, 50, and so they would have had, let's see, 50, 60, 70, 80. They would have had uh, 40, 50 years to uh, improve that uh, mind control technique, and uh, it was certainly clear when Bob 
told me about uh, not remembering about his entire work at S4 for those two uh, times he went up there, uh, the last two times he went up there, uh, that they have really, uh, re really have uh, made uh, progress in the mind control. You, you know, it is my firm belief that uh, because of all this talk after Bob Lazar came forward about Area 51, that things are no longer kept there because it's public knowledge. And obviously there's got to be new secret bases. And I've heard you say uh, Dulce and, and there was a firefight, of course, which I'm hoping you could talk about, and Sandia. Can you talk about those? Sure. There, uh, back 20 years ago, there was uh, 32 Air access only bases. Air access only means you can't drive there, or uh, the only way you can get in there is by air, and that's how they uh, uh, take care of the security. But um, uh, San, the, the ones that I know about now uh, are one was built when Area 51 was built, but kept more secret. It's 40 miles south of uh, Wendover, Utah, uh, in Nevada, uh, and it's uh, just to the uh, east of Highway. 93 or 95 as it goes up uh, to the border there and it's hidden by holograms and holograms are used to uh, to project uh, scenery or something to hide uh, whatever they want to hide now Sandia is halfway between um, Tonopah Test Range and Groom Lake and it started in 1980 uh, building it and they took off half the mountain there uh, on uh, the Paiute Mesa and put the uh, the base inside, and then put the the rest of the mountain top on on there, and that's where the uh, laboratories and all their offices and stuff are. Then about uh, 20 miles north of that, right out of the in the desert, uh, is where they have their new runways. They have uh, two parallel runways with a huge long hangar in between them, so that they can uh, operate secret programs uh, without. Uh, everybody seeing what's going on. In other words, on the east side of the hangars, uh, they can use that runway and keep it uh, uh, classified from anybody on the other side of the uh, uh, of the airfield. So Sandia is <clears throat> uh, was uh, operational in 1985. They had to figure out a way to get two or three thousand people to work every day, and they couldn't get more airplanes because people would be suspicious of why they needed more airplanes, and they couldn't use buses or cars because it took too long to get up there. So what they did is they built an underground high-speed train, which uh, has its terminus at uh, McCarran Field. Uh, you walk over to uh, underneath the uh, Luxor um, Casino, and there's a secret elevator that takes you down to the train. Uh, you get on there, and it makes one stop at the Bellagio, and uh, people get on at Bellagio, the people that work at Sandia, um, and then they go direct to uh, Sandia from the Bellagio. Now, in 2004, uh, they were making an additional track to this uh, secret train, and they accidentally hit the power grid for Bellagio and knocked the power out for three days. Well, this is unheard of because casinos have to have backup power uh, because there's so much money rolling around. But for some reason, um, they had no power for three days. They had to send all their guests to other hotels, and then they had to keep it a secret what happened. They had to make uh, accidental disclosure um, forms for all the people from Nevada Energy uh, to help work on it because, of course, Nevada Energy wouldn't have known anything about this, uh, but they would have had to be there to help repair the system because they hit the main grid, power grid, for Bellagio. That sounds like uh, one of the biggest massive cover-ups uh, around to go to every single casino in Nevada and say, hey, look, you're going to sign this non-disclosure agreement and not talk about it. Uh we have an unidentified flying object. Base of Moon.